And on the line with us is Scott Ritter, the former UN weapons inspector and author. His latest book is titled Deal Breaker, Donald Trump and the Unmaking of the Iran Nuclear Deal. Uh, you can tweet him at Real Scott Ritter, R-I-T-T-E-R. -T -T -E Scott, welcome back to the program. Jeez, it's been years since we've talked. You used to be a, almost a regular on this program back when uh, the Iraq war was uh, in its early phases. Well, it's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me. It's great having you with us. Um, so tell us about the Iran deal, the, the, you know, what it was, how it was put together, and why it's such a big deal that Donald Trump walked away from it. And for that matter, why Donald Trump walked away from it. Well, the Iran deal was, you know, decades in the making. Um, the United States has had an Iran problem since 1979 when the Iranian revolution, uh, the Islamic revolution, overthrew the, the Shah. Uh, and then subsequently um, uh, over 50 Americans were taken hostage for 444 days. Uh, the United States has never forgiven Iran for that act, uh, nor have we forgiven Iran for uh, the bombing of the Marine barracks in Beirut. Um, so there's been animosity between the United States and Iran for, for a long time now. Um, the, you know, so when you have this animosity, when, when you have a nation like Iran suddenly decide that uh, they want to pursue a you know, civilian nuclear energy program inclusive of the totality of the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, the United States steps in and says, no, this is, this is a policy that dates back to Ronald Reagan. It was continued by George Herbert Walker Bush and uh, also, you know, Bill Clinton. So this, you know, and, and then we can go on and on to George mm. W. Bush, Barack Obama. So this isn't just a Donald Trump issue. This is a United States issue. One of the problems is that Iran is a signatory to the uh, Nonproliferation Treaty, and they allow inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency to come into uh, Iran and oversee uh, their legitimate nuclear program. Uh, when Iran was denied access to the technology needed to uh, develop the fuel cycle, which they're permitted to do under the Nonproliferation Treaty, um, they chose to go to the black market and acquire this. Uh, and in doing so, they violated the Nonproliferation Treaty on, on several fronts. These are technical violations, but they're violations nonetheless. And uh, the United States built upon these violations to start to uh, portray Iran as not a state that was in violation to pursue a nuclear energy program that the United States wouldn't allow them to have, but rather a rogue nation seeking a nuclear weapons program. Uh, this is a fundamentally flawed assessment. And at that it's time, they were not seeking nuclear weapons. They were seeking Iran nuclear has power. Never, Iran has never sought a nuclear weapon. There is literally no evidence whatsoever wow. uh, that, uh, that sustains this this allegation and and the the thing is the united states knows this but the united states has a formula that it's been using in the middle east uh... i can't say they perfected it with iraq because uh... we only have to take a look at iraq today to understand that this was a colossal failure but it's an approach that has us hype up a um, a, a threat of, of tremendous significance, uh, tremendous consequence to the United States. In Iraq, it was weapons of mass destruction. Uh, with Iran, it's a nuclear weapons program. And then we create a situation where if Iran doesn't admit having this program, we say it exists. And so Iran, of course, failed to admit having a program they didn't have. Um, the United States continued to put sanction after Thank sanction you. after sanction in place. And we came to a situation where... Uh, either we admitted failure with sanctions or we would have to go to war. And this is the predicament that Barack Obama found himself in about the middle of his term, is that we had taken sanctions and we had taken putting pressure on Iran uh, as far as we could, and Iran just wasn't uh, conceding. In fact, Iran went from you know a dozen centrifuges in 2003 to around 12,000 centrifuges. So it's clear that we weren't succeeding in retarding Iran's uh, capabilities. <sighs> And this is why Barack Obama came up with the decision to uh, recognize Iran's right to enrich uranium, which they're allowed to do under the Nonproliferation Treaty. And you do that for, for the nuclear fuel cycle, not for the nuclear weapons. Well, it can be done for both. I mean, that's, right. the, you know, that's, that's the catch. Is, uh, if you, once you perfect the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, you have the ability now to produce a nuclear weapon. At least you have the ability to produce the enriched uranium necessary 
for a nuclear weapon. There's a whole bunch of other stuff that has to happen for you to have a viable, deliverable nuclear weapon, which Iran has not pursued. But mm. the, the the hard part, the, the 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 long tent, the long pole in the tent is the is the uranium. And Iran had this program in place. So what Barack Obama did was recognize that Iran indeed had this capability. Now the the, the decision was to la- allow them to have this capability, but to restrict it in a manner which denied Iran the theoretical ability uh, to break out. And what that means is within a year period of time, if Iran suddenly turned everything on and said, we're going to produce enough uh, enriched uranium for a nuclear weapon with the capability at hand, it would take them one year to do that. And we figured that within that year time, we could galvanize international support and either convince Iran to back down or build up a coalition necessary to... um, militarily solve this problem before Iran developed a nuclear bomb. Now, again, this is a completely theoretical uh, hypothetical because Iran didn't have a nuclear weapons program and is not pursuing nuclear weapons, but this is a political problem for the United States. And that's the, the thing about the Iran nuclear agreement. It is purely a domestic political consumption document. It has no real meaning because how do you restrict that which a country is not trying to pursue? It sounds to um, me, Scott, I mean, you and I were having these conversations back in, in 2000, as I recall, three, four, five, I forget what year it was, um, that, you know, you were going into Iraq and you were saying, hey, there's no, there's no weapons here. I can, I can prove it. I can show you. And, and the Bush administration, Dick Cheney in particular, was saying, see, proof that they're hiding it. You can't find it. That's proof that they're hiding it. I mean, it sounds right. like we're playing the exact same game. It's, it's, it is the exact same game. And moreover, you know, there, there was a period of time when this deal was being negotiated where people were demanding that Iraq, that Iran allow Iraq-type intrusive inspections. Uh, and they said the only way we could be convinced that Iran doesn't have uh, a, a hidden nuclear weapons program is to be able to go anywhere, anytime we want it, including the most sensitive uh, military sites, uh, the most sensitive political sites. Uh, we've seen this before. This is what the United States and others demanded of Iraq, and Iraq allowed this to happen, thereby giving the United States and other nations the intelligence needed to target their leadership and make an invasion that much more effective. Iran, of course, wasn't going to allow this and hasn't allowed it. There, and, but a lot of people say, that, and Donald Trump included, say this is the fundamental problem of this, um, of this approach, of this, of this deal, is that it doesn't allow these intrusive, anytime, anywhere inspections. Therefore, it's, you know, it's not a good inspection program. This is, this is a flawed argument. The agreement allows unprecedented levels of, of access by highly qualified technical inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency who would be able to detect with 100% certainty any deviation from the agreed-upon framework by Iran. Yeah, you don't no. need to go anywhere. Anytime. No, I, I absolutely understand. So we're talking with Scott Ritter, his new book, Deal Breaker. So, Scott, uh, you know, as, as you well know, Dick Cheney back in, in 2001, before 9-11, was in charge of the Energy, Energy Policy Committee, and he was uh, dividing up the oil fields of Iraq for privatization and sale to various countries and oil companies. Um, the, it, it turns out, it looks like in retrospect, one of the major reasons that Bush lied his way into a war in Iraq, in addition to the political benefit that he gained, which he had proclaimed a year before he ran for president in 2000, uh, you know, if he had a chance to invade Iraq, he would do it, and he'd do it in a way that was a big war, not a little war like his daddy did, so he would get reelected. But also that they wanted the oil. So we know that there was, a, you know, at least two big ulterior motives behind the invasion of Iraq that led to the death of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, the displacement of millions, um, this criminal war. What is the, now you have the United States and Israel, basically, the, the two countries, and, and Saudi Arabia, I believe, also, who are hyping this Iranian threat. What is the ulterior motive in this case? Uh, I mean, in a way, it's oil, but it's not gaining control of Iranian oil. It's denying Iran the ability to bring its oil to the market. But why do that? I mean, is this an extension of the Shia-Sunni battle that that Saudi Arabia has been engaged in forever? Well, I mean, that's the Saudi perspective. Uh, The American perspective is to keep the price of oil depressed. Remember, we think uh, uh, in in, in a global scale. It's not just about... um, you know, restricting Iranian uh, economic capability by denying them the ability to sell oil. It's about depressing the price of oil. So two things occur. One, American 
uh, fracking uh, becomes affordable. Uh, if the price of oil, you know, goes above, I don't know what the best, some say $60. Um, I mean, if it goes below $60, it becomes impossible for uh, American oil companies to, to extract oil from many of these wells that allow us this energy self-sufficiency today. Mm. But if the price of oil goes too high, um, Russia makes a lot of money and becomes, you know, economically uh, powerful. And so we need to strike a balance between the oil prices being too low and too high. And the best way to do that is to empower a single entity, in this case, Saudi Arabia, who has swing oil production capacity. They, you know, they pump out around 9 million barrels a day. They have a surge capacity of 11. So they're able to take that surge capacity and manipulate uh, the availability of oil on the global market to control oil prices. So what does this have to do with Iran? It seems like if we wanted to, we're going to hit a hard break here, Scott, in about 50 seconds. It seems that well, if, uh, go ahead. Iran, Iran is, has the capability of producing four to six to eight million barrels a day. Uh, and therefore, Iran's ability to flood the, uh, the market with its oil uh, restricts Saudi Arabia's ability to control it. So the best way to give Saudi Arabia leverage is to eliminate a major competitor. I see. Because I was thinking, hey, you know, if you want to keep the price down, let, let Iran sell their oil. But you don't want to keep it too low. And that's... Because in Russia, Russia makes money. Then Iran makes money. Right. Well, that's <laughs> if, it go, if the price goes up. So, but but right. if it goes but down, it hurts the U.S. frackers. Too low, then, American, then Americans can't uh, pump oil out of uh, West Texas oil fields. Fascinating. So the bottom line of your book here, Deal Breaker by Scott Ritter, forward by Seymour Hirsch, is we should re-engage in the Iranian deal? Look, we don't want a war with Iran, and that's the path we're heading on right now. The best way to avoid a war is to go back to the Iranian nuclear deal, the one that Barack Obama negotiated. Amen. Um, Scott Ritter, his new book, Deal Breaker, Donald Trump and the Unmaking of the Iran Nuclear Agreement. Brilliant stuff. Uh, Scott, great talking with you again. Thanks so much for dropping by today. Oh, thank you very much. And keep up the great work.